<laughs> anyway, um, uh, I, I want to plug our upcoming uh, speakers as well. Uh, next month on uh, Saturday, August 26, we have uh, Richard Goodrich, who's going to be speaking on comet madness, especially what happened with Halley's Comet in, I think, 1910 and 1911. I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, astronomers detected cyanogen, I believe it was, in the spectrum of the tail. And cyanogen is a poisonous gas. People heard about this in the news. And so everybody started buying gas masks uh, to protect themselves from the poison gas in, in the comet's tail. That was some of the craziness that happened back then. Then for our September meeting, we have Robert Yedeke from the University of Hawaii. And he's going to be speaking on the subject of asteroid mining. And he'll actually be here in person. He's flying from Hawaii over here on his way to do something uh, at one of the NASA centers. Uh, then for uh, October, we have uh, Sarah Moran speaking, and Sarah is going to be talking about observations she's making with the James Webb Space Telescope of planets both within our solar system and without as well. She's one of the, uh, the team that's been studying the TRAPPIST system, if that means anything to you. Anyway, so that's all I have to say about upcoming speakers, and now I'm going to embarrass Mark by introducing him. Uh, so Mark, founded the, no, the Ig Nobel Prizes and the ceremony in 1991, if I have this correct, and he serves as its master of ceremonies. He also co-founded and edits the magazine Annals of Improbable Research and wrote, this is improbable, the Ig Nobel Prizes and other books. By the way, this is one of those people who is so accomplished. If I were just to list all of his accomplishments, it would take most of the evening. Uh, he edits and writes much of the website and the blog uh, www.improbable.com and the monthly newsletter, mini, I have mini AR, AIR. Is that correct, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. I, I did something right. And he also writes this, the weekly feedback column in New Scientist magazine. Uh, he's created and hosts the Improbable Research podcast, which I know that many of you have listened to. And earlier, Mark was the editor of the much-loved magazine, The Journal of Re-Reproducible Results, which I believe Norm Sperling either founded or had something to do with. Norm is also an EAS member. Norm, if you're out there, you may be. Hello. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Mark is co-author with entomologist, is it Yuri Huller? Mm -hmm. Did I yeah. Oh, good. I pronounced it right. That looks like a, the name is Czech. He's, uh, that's exactly what I was about to guess, that it was a Czech name of the fairly new book, The Surprisingly Surprising Lives of Bark Beetles, Mighty Foresters of the Insect World. Mark holds a degree in applied mathematics from Harvard College, which means he's a really smart guy. And uh, before I well, before I forget, I'd like to also say that one of the winners of the Ig Nobel Prize then went on to win the Nobel Prize. And tonight, Mark is going to tell us who that was. And he's married to Robin Abrahams, who writes the misconduct, by the way, I love that pun, uh, advice column for the, Glo uh, for the Boston Globe magazine. So anyway, without any further ado, our tonight's speaker, Mark Abrahams. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to talk to you about a whole bunch of stuff. And please do ask any questions that come up along the way. I'm going to talk mostly about the Ig Nobel Prizes, and I started these together with a whole bunch of other people um, back in 1991. These are prizes. We give out 10 of them every year, and they are different from every other kind of prize I'm aware of. Almost every other prize in the world is either for the very best of something, you know, Olympic prizes for the best athletic performance, um, Academy Awards for the best movies and all that, or a few awards are for the very worst thing, the worst dressed prize and, and stuff like that. But for the Ig Nobel Prizes, good and bad are irrelevant. Um, important and trivial are irrelevant. Um, the only criteria, and it's the only criterion, it's a two-parter, is that you, if you win one of these prizes, you've done something that makes people laugh and then think. So it's something real, and if we've chosen well, it will make almost anybody anywhere in the world, no matter what their background, the moment they hear what you've done, they'll start laughing. And if we've chosen well, it'll stick in their head, and a week later, all they want to do is tell their friends about it. And so that's, that's the quality that wins these things. We get something like, in a typical year, 10,000 or so new nominations for Ig Nobel Prizes. 
And um, we, in general, with a few exceptions, but in general, um, we offer the prize to somebody or to a team. Um, we don't just give it to them. So almost all of the winners that uh, you will see, and you'll get to see them um, if you want to, because there's video of the ceremonies and most of them come, but almost all of them have decided to accept these prizes. So you might want to keep that in mind about these things. Um, let me mention a few. Uh, I, I've prepared a little list here of things that I thought might apply, especially well tonight, and uh, break them down into two kinds. So first is I'll mention some of the, the uh, things that won prizes last year. These are the 2002 Ig Nobel Prize winners, or some of them. And then I went back through the years, it's 33 years now, and um, I did a list of things that are astronomy related, or I decided to stretch it for you a little bit and make it also a little bit of aeronautics um, related and uh, one or two other things that are sort of distantly related, as you'll see. So I'll start out with mentioning some of the um, some of the recent winners last year's. Um, we gave a prize in the field of applied cardiology, first time we'd ever had something in that field. Uh, it went to an uh, international team, um, all based in Europe, for seeking and finding evidence that when new romantic partners meet for the first time and feel attracted to each other, their heart rates synchronize. There's a paper on this they've published, you can read. If you go to our website and look at video of the ceremony last year, you can see some of, in fact, most of the team discussing this. And then separately, they did a lecture afterwards. The winners get to do that, which is also on the website. So all these things are just about a sentence or so that I'm telling you. But really, often, these are just doorways into enormous caverns full of things that lead to other doorways and other caverns. We give a literature prize most years, and we did last year, it went to a team that analyzed what makes legal documents unnecessarily difficult to understand. In case you've ever wondered about that, you can go look at that paper and they'll tell you. There's a prize, biology prize we gave last year to a team based in Brazil and Colombia. They won for studying whether and how constipation affects the mating prospects of scorpions. <laughs> I'll remind you, if you want to ask about any of these, just say the word, but that may be something you're all familiar with. <laughs> Rich, can I interrupt him? Or uh, of course, okay. please. Yeah. Well, I'm you sorry, Mark, you've fallen into my didactic trap. I, I do want to say... Oh, no, not your didactic trap. Yes, that. Uh, uh, in opera, I don't know if you realize this, but you can always tell when uh, two people are in love in opera because at first they're singing different notes. And then uh, the, the convention in opera is that the two are singing exactly the same tunes, but typically an octave apart. And that's how all opera fans know that people have fallen in love with each other. So that's analogous to. Well, let me let me interrupt you now that you have asked a question. Okay. The Ig Nobel ceremony uh, has a lot of parts. They're jammed together, and it moves really fast. Um, you know, when we started the first year, of course, we you know half knew what we were doing, but we were inventing things, and that's been true every year for thirty three years now. At some point fairly early on, we started sticking other things in between the announcements of the winners. The, the winners are secret until that ceremony happens and they're introduced, they come on stage, and there uh, are always Nobel Prize winners on the stage there who shake their hands and hand them their Ig Nobel Prize. And between those 10 announcements of prizes, we started doing other things. And one year, I think about the sixth year in, we decided we'll write a little opera and get some opera singers to perform that, uh, do it about uh, something in science. And we did, and it was funny, and everybody had a good time, far as we could tell, and we did. So we, we made another opera on a different topic the next year, and that worked well, and we've been doing a new opera ever since. So um, in our operas, that rule you just suggested is not necessarily true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> well, I only heard one voice there, so I'm assuming you're not in love at the moment. But, but let's let's move on. Somebody, uh, uh, there was a question that you were going to ask, right? 
No, that was it. No, was it wasn't. Comment. He was just interrupting you. <laughs> oh, okay. So you were making a questionable comment. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that, exactly that correct. is correct. Okay. Well, I'll move on quickly through some of last year's winners, and then I'll get to the uh, the uh, astronomy and astro stuff and aero stuff. Um, medicine prize is another field that most years we have a prize in. Went to a large team, all based, <coughs> excuse me, in Poland for um, showing by experiment that when patients undergo some forms of toxic chemotherapy, those patients suffer fewer harmful side effects when ice cream replaces one traditional component of the procedure. Sounds great. Where do I sign up for chemotherapy? Uh, you could get ice cream without the chemotherapy, <laughs> by the way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, standard, I'll, I'll standard, confirm that. That's true. My standard line with my wife is, you promised me ice cream. <laughs> okay, just don't sing it, please. <laughs> we gave a prize last year in the field of engineering, um, and it went to a team in Japan. The engineering prize went to them um, because they were trying to discover, again, by experiment, the most efficient way for people to use their fingers when turning a knob. <laughs> and it's much more involved than you might realize, and it probably affects you most days a lot more directly than you may realize. Uh, we gave a prize in art history. We've only done that a few times last year, and that went to a, a team spread across several countries for a study that they published in a scholarly journal, and the study is called a multidisciplinary approach to ritual enema scenes on ancient Maya pottery. <laughs> Multidisciplinary approach to ritual enema scenes on ancient Maya pottery. You're making it up, Mark. We don't believe you. Go to our website. You'll get a link to the paper. You can read the paper. You can see videos of the two researchers who spent a lot of time on this telling you all about it. Did any of those scenes also appear on the Mayan calendar? <laughs> you can get in touch with the people who did this, and they can tell you that. Now it's um I I will come close to guaranteeing that none of you who's in the room or or listening tonight um was familiar with any part of that story unless maybe you heard about this prize last year. Um not many not that it was hidden, it was just in a, a scholarly journal not very many people would see. All right. Um, physics prize. We give a physics prize pretty much every year. It went to two different teams who had, um, a, I'll say, attacked, but they'd worked on the same problem and come up with very different solutions to that or explanations. And they shared the Ig Nobel Physics Prize for trying to understand how ducklings manage to swim in formation. Wow. And it's a lot of fluid dynamics um, of, uh, very, from very different approaches. And they, they, they know each other and, and get along well and mostly agree that both of them did correct good work. But on the other hand, they mostly disagree about which of their explanations is a better explanation. <laughs> and it could well be that both are equally wonderful or equally not quite perfect explanations. But there too, go look it up. And it's something that you've all, um, at least I expect uh, all of you have seen at some point, but probably not gone into the kind of detail that they did. Uh, Economics Prize last year went to a team in Italy for explaining, uh, and, and two thirds of the team are physicists. They won the Economics Prize for explaining mathematically why success most often goes not to the most talented people, but instead to the luckiest. <laughs> they, um, two thirds of that team were winning their second Ig Nobel Prize. Their first Ig Nobel Prize from about 12 years ago, maybe, was for a paper they did, um, which explained why, again, based on mathematical simulations, explained why in any organization in the long run, everybody's better off if people are chosen for promotions um, 
randomly rather than by any other system. And you might want to look into why they say that. So, and let's see. And last year we gave a prize in a field of safety engineering. And I should tell you, we, again, I think this is different from most other prizes. Most prizes that have categories, they fill the same categories every year. We pick the winners first, and then we try to figure out what category could possibly explain what this person has or this team has done. And that's why we came up with safety engineering as a category. We've given that several times. And this time it went to um, somebody in Sweden who won the safety engineering prize for developing a moose crash test dummy. <laughs> he did that about 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years ago. It was his master's thesis. And oh, his work has been I... used by many, uh, possibly most of the large car manufacturers in the world. So in we Sweden, have a question. As, yeah, and if you've been in Sweden, you may what? have noticed um, on the roads, if, if you were on the roads, that there are signs in much of the country, um, a little graphic warning you about colliding with a moose, because it happens a lot there. There are a lot of mooses and a lot of collisions. Uh, those signs, by the way, were very became very popular with tourists pretty quickly, I guess, and, and tourists started to swipe the signs and <laughs> take them home. But the Swedish yeah. government apparently was pretty clever about it, realized what was happening and started making and selling the signs to tourists. So <laughs> they're perfect. So yeah. what's what's your comment? Then? It's just a comment. I just wanted to say that one of our members was almost killed by colliding with a moose. That was Al Stern oh. in Maine. So it actually is quite a real problem. And yeah. so, so despite the fact that it's at first you would think it's something really quite ridiculous. In fact, if you collide with a moose are really enormous creatures. Yeah. Rebecca, what's the weight of the moose? It's about moose, about moose are about six foot at their shoulder. Yeah, six feet at their shoulders. And they weigh over a thousand pounds, I think. I think a bull moose is close to, to three thousand. Three thousand. So if your car, and so Al said he was driving along the freeway at 60 miles an hour, and he doesn't remember the collision, and it almost killed him. The wow. moose ended up impaled, and it's un, un, unbelievable. So having a moose mannequin at first might seem ridiculous, but actually it's a very smart idea. I think yeah. everyone should, everyone should have one. Yes. <laughs> if you see uh, if you see photos of of the moose mannequin. Um, the photos look even more ridiculous than the idea. <laughs> as soon as you hear somebody tell the kind of story you just told, uh, yep. it turns into one of those stories typical of Ig Nobel Prize winners that seems crazy and funny, and yet there's an awful lot of serious stuff that's attached one way or another. Which reminds me to say that most of the people who win Ig Nobel Prize, well, all of them, I'm pretty sure this is true. Nobody who has ever set out with the main goal of winning an Ig Nobel Prize has ever succeeded. And that's likely to stay that way. This quality of doing something that makes almost anybody laugh, but then think hard about it, um, that's really hard to manufacture. It's almost always a side effect of what's gone on. And something that always um, makes me feel happy uh, every year there are the 10 winners and something that i hear from a lot of the winners every year after they learn the full list of who else in addition to them won, because you know the winners don't know who the other winners are until big nobel day but after they learn an awful lot of them say pretty much the same thing to us which is those other nine things that got a prize those are all so funny but why did you give a prize to us? What we did was, <laughs> and that. Let me talk about that for just a moment. Before you, before you do, I have a question, yeah. not from Dave. Yeah. Uh, hold on for a moment. Hi, Go ahead. my name is Akshay. Oh, hi, Akshay. Hi. Good. Uh, I have a question. You said this idea was a part of a master's thesis. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. The is sound that, is it, not really good. Moose, here. Are you talking about the moose idea? Yeah. Yeah. Come around here. Um, so he was he was uh, asking whether the moose uh, 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 idea was part of a master's thesis. That's what yeah. you mentioned, right? Yeah. Yeah. His, uh, his whole master's thesis was about making that crash test dummy, about why he did it and how well it worked. And the professor allowed it. Oh it yeah. Part of master's thesis. 
why not? This this is a very <laughs> serious problem they were looking at. You I mean you just heard somebody you know describe okay. what happened? Have you seen a moose? No. Wow, well, you, you would you would change your tune very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but one thing one thing that he how, said, how which is worth that? passing on to anybody who. Yeah, one thing he said that's worth passing on to anybody who um, who you know who might be driving up in uh, a far northern place where there are a lot of mooses is that you know nobody expects to be hit by a moose and they usually don't expect to even see one on the road but it all happens really suddenly and a lot of people's instant reaction is to decide that they they in their car can outrace the moose and he said that's usually very wrong. Do not try to outrace a moose. They they can go a lot faster than you expect. Wow. Right now, can he hear me because I'm so loud? Um, yeah. He can probably hear you. I'm not you. sure if that's why I can hear you, but yes, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, Lark, my wife is a veterinarian, and one of her favorite videos, it, she just showed it to uh, the, the dubious, our dubious member. <laughs> it's a video of a moose charging through how deep is that snow six or seven oh, this, feet. Is, this is this is the moose walking on the side of the road oh this is just a moose walking on is that our moose the yeah. one that we saw yeah. okay no, i'm sorry but anyway we we watched a video of a mm -hmm. moose these these people were in the snow i think they were uh uh doing cross-country skiing and uh, they saw this moose charging through them charging at them through snow that was six or seven feet deep and Rebecca, I would estimate that moose was moving at a speed of 35, maybe 40 miles an hour. They can move un incredibly fast and through snow. I mean, wow. this it was unbelievable to see this. And these people thought they were going to die, and the moose just went right by them and ignored them. <laughs> anyway. It was going for the crash test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was probably trying to face with a crash test. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was so active. Okay. All right, Mark. You can you can continue. <laughs> okay. Well, I was um I was starting to say that um, this 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 idea that many of the winners have that what the other winners did is funny, but what they did is just ordinary. I think just about everybody has that in their life, and it's really hard to realize about whatever you do. You know, whatever you do, if you think back to say the very first day, if it's a kind of work, the very first day you took that job or if you're in school, the very first day you showed up and took a class in something that was brand new to you, and you went home at the end of that day, you were probably full of stories about how crazy all the little tiny things were that happened that you noticed that day. And then the second day you go home and you have a bunch of stories that are about crazy little things that happened, but you don't have as many stories as you had the first day. And after about four days, you don't have any stories because you're used to it. And I think that's true with everybody about everything that whatever you're doing, you know, as your normal work or your normal life, whatever it is, you get used to it. It seems normal to you. And if it goes on for many years doing it, it's really hard to appreciate what it looks like to somebody who never ever comes in contact with the kind of thing you do. So keep in mind, you know, that when you're hearing about some of these people who've won Ig Nobel Prizes and why it it makes sense for them to have that feeling that, but what we did is just ordinary. We weren't trying to be funny. No, they weren't. <laughs> and, and often they don't, I'll give you another example. Um, there was a prize we gave, um, again, this goes back 20 years or so to a team of, I think, seven scientists in Australia. And they won a prize, also a physics prize uh, for um, a paper they had published in a journal and the paper was called something like an analysis of the forces required to drag sheep across various surfaces. <laughs> and when I called up the team, well, I called one of them to get in touch with them and offer them the prize. It turned out that um, the one I had chosen knew all about the Ig Nobel Prizes because these things get a lot of attention in the press around the world. And he he said um, he wasn't, you know, he's was happy to, to be getting a prize. And after he talked to the rest of the team, they had the same reaction. But that phone call from us was the first moment any of them realized that what they'd done seems funny. 
<laughs> well, that kind of begs the question: how, how do, you, what is your process for finding these studies? I mean, do you just, you know, stack up a pile of journals at the end of the year and start pouring through them, or I mean, how do you, how do you reduce the enormous list? of studies that are done every year by scientists all over the world into a manageable set. Yeah, that's that, um, that qualified. That, that's not only a good question, but the, the problem is larger, at least, than what you described, because the, we give prizes not just for things that happened recently. We sometimes go back as far as about 50 years. Huh. As long as there's, even if the people who did it are no longer alive, if there still is somebody around who worked with them or a family member, somebody who knew them well, who could accept the prize on their behalf, um, then that's you know, fair, a good, you know, a good candidate for a prize. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there. And whatever we do not choose in one year, we will consider again the next year if it if it's a strong candidate. So yeah, how do we how do we find these things and how do we choose these things? We're always looking, you know, we as the editors of the magazine, plus a whole bunch more people involved in the Ig Nobel Prizes. And that's a lot of stuff we run across, some of it the way you describe looking through journals and things. But most of the things that we learn about, we learn because people tell us every day, every day, there is a uh, flood, a small flood of uh, email, sometimes phone calls, sometimes mail, no telegrams ever, um, no faxes these days, but stuff comes in from people, most of them people we've never heard of, and they are everywhere, uh, because they notice something they thought might win an Ig Nobel Prize, so they tell us, and that's where, that's where we hear about most of this stuff, and pretty consistently something like 10 to 20% of all the nominations that come in are people who nominate themselves, but they almost never win. <laughs> yeah. It's happened a few times. And, and again, none of them had set out to win a Ding Nobel Prize. It's just after they did whatever they did or something happened to them, they realized it was funny and, uh, and are kind of proud of it. So they got in touch. Uh, so that's, that's it. And then we, um, we argue a lot. <laughs> we we really <laughs> argue a lot. Very good. Uh, Dave? I have a process question. How many people vote on the prize? I mean, do you have uh, just people who are physics people who vote on the physics prize? Do no, we don't do it that way. It's, um, yeah, how, do you just, how, do you, how do you do it? Because we, we want, you know, if we do a good job, then nobody who hears about it should have to have any background at all in any of these subjects to be able to appreciate that this thing is funny and to become curious about it. And so our task is to pick something that has that quality, to pick 10 of them, and also to describe whatever it is accurately in about one sentence. Because if it's much longer than that, people are not gonna take the time. And it's actually a harder task than that because most of the people who hear about these winners are in countries where English, which is, you know, my only real language, uh, it, it's not the language they speak there. So most people are going to hear about it in a different language. They're going to see it in the news or hear about it from a friend and it will be translated. So that sentence that we came up with that describes something that won, we try really hard to write that in a way that's going to be uh, almost indestructible when it gets translated. And we know it's not going to get translated just once. It, when it gets into news organizations, it's going to then pass through one or two editors and a writer, and some of them are going to do further changes. So, you know, you've, you've all, I'm quite sure, spent a lot of time wrestling with sentences to try to make them ultra clear. And that's, that's where an awful lot of our work goes into. You know, we know that every citation for every prize is going to go through this torture chamber that's going to, you know, try to pulverize the meaning out of this thing. And we try really hard to make that meaning so clear and so indestructible that it will still be the same when people hear about it. That well, answer the question more or less? 
just just and how many is it just the editors who how many people vote on the prize is, is it just the editors who vote or is it no there's a, a um, it's a it's a lot of very small meetings that and it there are roughly 100 people or so involved uh, wow wow we never have a meeting with that large a group and there's they're spread across many countries okay and some of them have Ig Nobel prizes, and and some of them have Nobel prizes. Oh, and I and I think it was Dave at the beginning um, mentioned that there is somebody who won an Ig Nobel prize and later won a Nobel prize. Um, his name is Andre Geim. He's originally Russian, and then he moved to the Netherlands. That's where he was based when he won his Ig Nobel prize, which was in the year two thousand. And then uh, he moved to England. Uh, he's at the University of Manchester now. He's a physics professor. And um, 10 years after he won his Ig Nobel Prize, he was awarded a Nobel Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize he won uh, together with a British physicist um, named um, uh, Michael Berry. Um, and the, if anyone here is a, a physicist, you probably know Michael Berry's name for a lot of things he's come up with over the years. They won an Ig Nobel Prize because they used magnets to levitate a frog. Oh, those guys. And, and they explained the physics of why that happens. And they did that partly because they were pretty sure that almost no professional physicist would believe it was possible. <laughs> but it is, and <laughs> you can see videos, and if you've got the equipment, which is not terribly rare, you can do it yourself. Uh, 10 years later, uh, the, the Nobel Prize given to Andre Geim and to one of his students was for doing something that, when you hear how they did it, sounds fully as goofy as the idea of levitating a frog with magnets. Um, but it won them a, a Nobel Prize. And um, the non-goofy explanation of what they did was they were the first people to come up with enough of a material called graphene that they could play with it and start measuring how it behaves. Before that, chemists knew that this stuff exists, but they could never tease out a sample. Um, even though it, everybody has some, it's in the pencils you have. Uh, the graphite, the gray stuff in pencils is just millions or maybe billions, I, I don't know the order of magnitude, but a lot of layers of this flat two-dimensional um, uh, chicken wire shaped, um, when you get down to the molecular level, um, uh, carbon, and it's called graphene. Um, but those layers stick together. That's why you, you'd have a tough time getting them out of a pencil. But they did, and they did it in a way that a little kid could do. In fact, that every little kid does do, and they won a Nobel Prize for doing it. I'm sorry, how did they do it? I have to ask. <laughs> how did they do oh, it? Let me tell you what probably each of you did that had you been more aware of the background um, would have won you a Nobel Prize. But Andre Geim and his student did it, and they were aware of the background, so they won a Nobel Prize. If you've ever taken a pencil, and a piece of paper, and you scribble, you know, you scribble on the paper with it. And then um, you take a piece of scotch tape and put it on, and you pick it up. So, you know, a bunch of the gray stuff is sticking to the tape, and then they took the tape and just flexed it. And this little, you know, cloud of gray stuff came down. Wow. They put they put some under a microscope, and some of that stuff that came out was little tiny bits of graphene, and that's how they did it. Wow! Wow! Amazing! Yeah. We're all gonna go home and do it. <laughs> well, you can, but um, if if you're if you're hoping to win a prize, maybe um, apply Too for late. some other prize. <laughs> Um, I put together a list of, uh, as I mentioned before, of some of the Ig Nobel Prizes that are directed, uh, uh, excuse me, not directed, but uh, related to astronomy or, or to aeronautics or vaguely uh, like that. So let me mention a few. Um, I'll go backwards in time. Uh, this first one is not astronomy, but consider this related to uh, aeronautics uh, or aeronautics, if you will. Um, 2022, we gave a prize. We decided finally to 
give this the category of transportation. So it was the 2022 Ig Nobel Prize for transportation. Uh, went to a large team of scientists from Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Brazil, the UK, and the USA. They won a prize for determining by experiment whether it's safer to transport an airborne rhinoceros upside down. <laughs> I will not take questions on this, but if you go and Google that at all, you can see video. Um, let's see, uh, a couple of years before that, a uh, prize to uh, a couple of scientists in Japan for um, here, I'm thinking it relates to um, to astronomy because astronomy involves looking at things at a distance. This prize in 2016 went to the team in Japan for investigating whether things look different when you bend over and view them between your legs. <laughs> and the answer is generally yes, things do. Um, Should I comment first? Okay. You won't let me ask any more questions. I'm yeah, yeah I'm, I'm banning you. <laughs> right. 2013, we gave a prize um, jointly in two fields, biology and astronomy. Went to a large team based in Sweden, Australia, Germany, South Africa. Um, they won their prize for discovering that when dung beetles get lost, those dung beetles can navigate their way home by looking at the Milky Way. Whoa, mm -hmm. yeah. I've heard about this. That's amazing. Yep. Uh, gave a prize in 2013, physics prize to a large team um, from several countries, but they were doing the work in Italy for discovering that some people, in fact, many people, would be physically capable of running across the surface of a pond if those people and that pond we're on the moon. <laughs> They're trying to look at how, you know, more strength of gravity would affect people that way. There's a lot of variables in that problem. Yes, and, and think about what kind of experiment you would try to do if you wanted to measure this. And they did it. And here too, there's, for a lot of this stuff, including this, there's video of this stuff. You can go on, on the web and find it without too much difficulty. Um, and in fact, if you look at this year's Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, which will be in the middle of September, um, you will see some of those researchers, because um, this year's opera involves, because the new opera this year involves that a little bit, um, and there will be um, a little piece of video of their old experiment that you'll see there. All right, so let's see, that's that. Um, going back um, 2012, um, this one is not astronomy um, directly, but it, this affects everybody. Uh, so I thought you might want to hear about it. 2000, uh, 2012, the Ig Nobel Literature Prize was awarded to the US Government General Accountability Office for issuing a report about reports about reports. It <laughs> recommends the preparation of a report about the report about reports about reports all right i'm gonna i'm gonna let uh kosh ask his question hold on let me see if i can get this to work it looks like if i could find him i saw you raised your hand kosh i'm going to allow you to talk if you'd like to ask a question if not yeah uh am i audible yeah we hear you hi yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, my, yeah, my question, I, it just popped in my head when you were talking about the ceremony uh, for this year. Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to or can you spill some beans for what's going to happen for the 10 prizes this year? Like, any, you said these are not known and these are these things are known at the ceremony, but can you tell us something like a sneak peek? Um, yeah, I can tell you there will be 10 new winners again. <laughs> 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 okay, so, okay, I, I'll refine my question. Something that we cannot anticipate, or we would not have anticipated anyway. Uh, you're asking if I could tell you? Is that what you're asking? 
if you could and if you will. <laughs> oh, well, the answer to the first one is yes. But um, September 14th is the day that the prizes will be announced. Uh, the pandemic affected us in a lot of ways. Up until the, the pandemic came, we always had it uh, in a big theater at Harvard University. It's also the biggest classroom there. Uh, and televised it live, webcast it live. In fact, we, in 1995, we started webcasting it and later learned that that was one of the first webcasts of anything that ever happened. Um, but when the pandemic came, we had to stop doing it in a theater for you know, fairly obvious reasons. And we still haven't gone back. So this year, again, the ceremony um, is gonna be only online. Mm -hmm. We are having a second event that will happen a month later that will be in that theater, much, a much simpler event. A lot of the winners, in fact, most of the winners will be coming. And this second event, a month after the ceremony, by this time, nothing is secret, um, will be there and it will be the winners and maybe one or two Nobel laureates as well. And the whole event will be them asking each other questions about their work. Oh, wow. Which should be really fun. We did a, yeah. we did a, a test run of, um, that kind of event about three or four months ago at Stanford, in fact, and it worked out so well. That was what decided us to, you know, take this first step back into a theater this year. So I'm 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 sorry. I I I wish I I wish I could and would give you hints about the winners, but sorry. <laughs> so let me move on down to, um, through some uh, some other um, past winners here. Uh, 2005, Ig Nobel Peace Prize went to a couple of scientists at Newcastle University in the UK for electrically, uh, electrically monitoring the activity of a brain cell in a locust while that locust was watching selected highlights from the movie Star Wars. <laughs> it was from the scene when all the fighters are diving down into the Death Star. Oh. And what they were trying to do was they were trying to figure out how is it that locusts in swarms don't collide very often. Oh. And they were getting their funding partially from, I think it was Volvo, one of the car companies, you know, who wanted to see if there's something might come of this that would help them um, build some thought, collisions but... uh, with mooses and with other things. <laughs> Especially against locusts. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, let's see. This uh, next one I'll mention is uh, indirectly involved, but it, it, it involved um, it involved jet planes and rockets um, on the ground. Uh, this was the 2003 Engineering Prize uh, went to the uh, to th three people for jointly giving birth in 1949. This is one where we went back a long way. So this prize given in 2003 uh, went to three people for jointly giving birth in 1949 to Murphy's Law, the basic engineering principle that if there are two or more ways to do something, um, or one of those ways can result in a catastrophe, someone will do it. Or in other <clears throat> words, if anything can go wrong, it will. And that's a really good story and it leads to all kinds of things that you know about that you probably have no way of knowing otherwise are connected. Um, Murphy himself was part of the story. Uh, Captain Edward Murphy, who was in the um, the army at uh, at that point, um, uh, he he was no longer alive. But uh, one of his sons came to the ceremony, and um, it involved. I don't want to get into much of the story because it, it it it's it's a wonderful but long story, but. It involves something that I expect many of you have seen a long time ago, um, photographs and maybe films from that period, from the late 40s, of a man strapped into a rocket sled. Oh, yeah. And the camera is a close-up of his face when the sled suddenly stops. Yeah. You know, the sled was, it stopped because at the, at the it was on large, uh, long railroad tracks in the desert at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, and the braking mechanism was a pool of water that it ran into, and so the thing would stop. And you, if you've seen it, you probably 
can conjure up the the memory of that man's face looking like it was almost melting in that. So um, that was John Paul Stapp. He was the medical officer in that, and he's a co-winner of that Ig Nobel Prize. And I strongly urge you to look up that name, John Stapp, S-T-A-P-P. -P. Um, he was extremely famous, especially in the science and technology world for a long time. Now he's not well known, but, but should be. And he affected your life in many ways. For one thing, uh, he, from what I've been told, he probably is more responsible than any other single person for the fact that seatbelts um, are required to be built into automobiles. Um, 2003 biology prize, um, this involved flight, which is why I'm mentioning it, uh, went to uh, Case Muliker, a biologist in the, the Netherlands, for documenting the first scientifically recorded case of homosexual necrophilia in the mallard duck. Ooh. And I will tell you, if you're not familiar with this, whatever you're expecting, it, it's not that. <laughs> it, it's, it's way different from whatever you're expecting. And I strongly urge you to remember, maybe write down four words and Google them later or tomorrow or something. Uh, the four words are TED Talk. We all know TED Talk. So TED Talk Dead Duck. <laughs> it will lead you to something wonderful. All right, uh, let's see, 2001, we gave a prize in the field of astrophysics to Dr. Jack and Rexella Van Impe for their discovery that black holes fulfill all the technical requirements to be the location of hell. <laughs> Anybody in the room familiar with Jack Van Impe and Rexella Van Impe? Anyone? Vaguely mentioned all of it. Yeah. They're televangelists oh. um, who had um, for many years a, a television uh, program every week set up uh, as if it were a news program. And they would take items that appeared in the news and interpret them uh, huh. using their special knowledge. And sometimes they would, they would interpret um, science related things and especially this one about uh, black holes fulfilling all the technical requirements to be the location of hell. Uh, let's see, uh, 1997 astronomy prize went to Richard Hoagland. Is that a familiar name to anybody? Uh, Richard Hoagland, H-O-A-G-L-A-N-D? Uh, yes, very, very familiar. For identifying artificial features on the moon and on Mars, including a human face on Mars, and 10 mile high buildings on the far side of the moon. So he won the 1997 astronomy prize. Did he show up? Uh, no, unfortunately he did, he did not. <laughs> Sorry to say. 1996 um, prize in meteorology uh, went to Bernard Vonnegut uh, at uh, State University of Albany for a report that he published a physics report he published called chicken plucking as measure of tornado wind speed <laughs> why not <laughs> okay. and you, you may be familiar with his younger brother um kurt vonnegut um, bernie was the scientist in the family and uh, a lot of the stuff that kurt got interested in he got interested in because his older brother bernie was doing it Whoa, that's amazing. Um, ice Nine, if that's familiar to you from reading a book. Uh, Bernie oh, yeah. Vaughn did a lot of research on the structure of ice. Huh. Um, let's see. And I'll mention two other things which are um, kind of distantly related to, uh, to the, the things that your group is theoretically interested in. 1994 Literature Prize, Ig Nobel Literature, Literature Prize, went to L. Ron Hubbard, uh, <laughs> the ardent author of science fiction, founding father of Scientology, for his crackling good book called Dianetics, which is highly <laughs> profitable to mankind or to a portion thereof. <laughs> 
And I'll mention one more prize. Um, the psychology prize in 1993 went to John Mack of Harvard Medical School and David Jacobs, a professor at Temple University, um, for their leaping conclusion that people who believe, <clears throat> excuse me, people who believe they were kidnapped by aliens from outer space probably were. And especially <laughs> for their conclusion that the, uh, fo and this is a quote, the focus of the abduction is the production of children. <laughs> So that's that's a, a few of the Ig Nobel Prizes that are uh, somewhat strongly related to things that you guys get together to talk about all the time. That's a fine list. Yeah. So I, I have a question. questions. Yeah, yeah. I have a I have a question. It's um, um, I'll try not to editorialize too much before I before I ask it. Um, Why don't you editorialize first uh, silently and then ask the question? Yeah. All right. Here, I'll try to do that. Um, okay. What? Yeah, that was a great editorial. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. um, you've managed to do something that I think uh, a lot of professions uh, fail to do, and I think that uh, uh, science as a profession also fails to do in general, which is to find ways to inject humor into what is otherwise a serious pursuit. And I think that... Can I stop? Can I interrupt yeah. there? Yeah. yeah. From my point of view, that's not what I'm doing. That's interesting. So elaborate on that. From my point of view, we're not adding humor. From from my oh, point of view, we're we're clearing out humor. <laughs> we're clearing out some of the stuff that yeah. makes it hard to see how funny bits of this stuff are. Mm. Okay, well that that's fine. That that is that that is what kind of what I was thinking. But you 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 said that a lot better. Um, the to to what extent do you think your efforts or efforts like this can help? Um, uh, uh, stop the erosion of trust and expertise. How many hours you got? <laughs> um, can, well, quite a bit can, will, uh, I don't know about. I was, I'll say can will. is better. Will, will is a little bit stronger. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of what's going on now, you know, increasingly over the last few decades is very conscious and often very um, largely funded efforts to confuse people. Yeah. So which is, um, you know, a different thing than the basic question of people um, being intimidated by something or just not having not knowing enough background on something to appreciate what's going on or that kind of thing so it's it's really you know at least two big parts to the problem but you know what what's going on so blatantly right now with people who most of them know full well what's actually happening in the world and stand up every day and kind of gleefully proclaim that the opposite is happening. I and mean, that's, you know, that's, that's a different kind of thing. And um, I hope that sometimes um, when they say things that are so completely stupid and ridiculous that they're funny, that uh, if enough people actually start laughing in their faces, that might, uh, might have a little effect. Might make a difference. Yeah. Good. I like that. Um, actually, in that case, it's them doing oh. the work. It's just the rest of us. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, that's our they're, job. They're, they're doing the heavy lift. Help them. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Uh, Akshay has another question. Yeah, uh, Mark. First of all, thank you so much for taking us through this very awesome and funny and hilarious list. Uh, the question is: Has there been an instance? So it's a two-part question. The first is: Have there been any instance where the like? award receiver have gotten cold feet thinking that yeah. receiving this award might, you know, discredit or like, you know, remove the sincerity from their work. And mm -hmm. if so, um, what, how do you prepare uh, or how do you do a contingency plan for that kind of occurrence? Oh, all right. Well, remember I said that in, in almost all cases, we offer people the prize. Yeah. What we do is we very quietly get in touch with them and we offer them the prize. And if they say no for whatever reason, for any reason, 
that's okay. We don't give them the prize and we don't tell anybody that it was offered to them. We just give it to somebody else. That doesn't happen a lot. Um, 90%, I'd say, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's something like 90% of the people who are offered Ig Nobel Prizes say yes. Um, when they say no, most of the people who've said no had what seemed to me a pretty good reason. Uh, and the bulk of them did it because they're at the beginning of a career. They happen to have a advisor or a boss or whoever who really doesn't like them and is making their life miserable. Oh. And they need to just endure for another few years or whatever, get their degree or get their next job or, you know, get out of there, uh, just keep their head down. So mm -hmm. of course we're, of course we're not gonna, you know, force yeah. them to do something in public that, that might, you know, might blow back on them in some way. And um, when that happens, sometimes we'll wait a few years, five years or something and get in touch and offer them again, but there, there's no guarantee about that. Every once in a while, there's somebody who just doesn't want it. Every once in a while, we run into somebody who um, I think fits the stereotype, <laughs> a certain stereotype of, of scientists that people have that's actually kind of rare. Somebody who feels that everything they're doing is so important that how dare anybody laugh at it, even if what they did is funny to themselves, you know? A lot of a lot of a lot of stuff that people do is funny to them, and they love to tell stories about it. But if somebody else tells the same story, and there's laughter, that's horrible. So every once in a while, we run into somebody like that, and you know, same deal. That's what they want. Okay, we just won't give them the prize. Thank you very much. Um, Rich and Sue have a question. Um, have gravity waves made the Ig hit list yet? <laughs> Define hit list, please. <laughs> yeah, they're they're uh, typing in their question, so I can't really define it for them. I would say, uh, has anything come up yet involving gravity waves as a possible candidate for an Ig Nobel? Well, Prize? look, when we get many thousands of nominations every year, <laughs> lots of stuff is involved in that. We don't discuss nominations, uh, you know, not specific ones. Um, but let me let me ask you a question that's important to that, um, you know, leading someday perhaps to an answer to the question you just asked. How would you describe something about gravity waves in a way, in one sentence, that anybody in the world who hears that sentence will immediately start laughing and appreciate why what you said is funny? and will be so intrigued by the idea of it that they want to talk to their friends. How would you describe that? That's a great question. I'd have to think about that for a while. So Rich and Sue, if you come up with an answer, type it into the Q&A box. And also send it to us, you know, as a nomination. Uh, yeah, send it to the, send it to the award committee. <laughs> if you go to the beach, you might find gravity waves, but you have to look up. <laughs> if you're looking up and you go to the beach, you might step on something too that you might yeah. not have to step on. I have a, I have a, a quick question All about right. the poster behind your right shoulder. It's very well done. The finger fell off its perch because it was so funny. Yep. Uh, the story behind that. Yeah, it's our logo for the magazine and for the Ig Nobels. Um, we call that drawing, that design, the stinker. <laughs> and the idea that just was somebody who is thinking so intently about something that they fall off their chair and don't even realize it. There's a lot of other stuff behind me. That's a part of the museum here of um, things that have won Ig Nobel Prizes. The pink flamingo there is there because the person who created the plastic pink flamingo won an Ig Nobel Prize for art. The bra that you see there. Oh, yes. You know, is there anybody there who's familiar with the emergency bra? 
I think I know the story. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it in the video. Yeah, you want to tell the story? It's, it, it, it could do double purpose. You could use it as a mask, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah invented by Dr. Elena Bodnar, and it's engineered so it can be quickly separated into a pair of protective face masks. And each one has straps, so it leaves your arms free. And also, it's got the kind of wiring built in at the top that you everybody's familiar with now from um, COVID face masks. So yeah. it seals pretty well. And we dare you to put it on <laughs> she was a, she was a, she got her medical degree, medical degree in um, Ukraine. That's where she grew up. And soon after she became a doctor, the um, Chernobyl power plant in Ukraine melted down. She was one of the doctors who treated victims of wow. the wow. power plant. Uh, her husband is a scientist. Uh, they, some years later, moved to the U.S. Um, she was teaching at uh, where University of Chicago Medical School. And she was always um, thinking uh, almost obsessively about ways that people might be able to protect themselves if they find themselves in the situation that people were in at Chernobyl. Because um, she said most of the medical, most of the worst medical stuff at Chernobyl was from the stuff people breathed in, radioactive particles. Once it got into people's lungs, it tended to stay there and continue do, doing really horrible things. So she was wondering, is there something people might be able to do to protect themselves so that if completely unexpectedly the air is filled with stuff that you shouldn't be breathing, you could at least get yourself someplace safer, you know, into a building or something. And she and her husband had a baby and she was uh, at home one day and she noticed her infant son was on the floor playing with his mother's bra and he put his mother's bra over his face and that's where the idea came from for this thing if you go to our website you can see video from the ig nobel prize ceremony the year that she got her prize that was, uh, she came and that was the first public demonstration of this invention. It's patented also, you should look up the patent. It's a wonderful <laughs> patent. Uh, the details are wonderful. So she had a demonstration and in that she, um, she she's a very um, elegant woman and she was wearing a lovely dress and she um, reached down into her dress and pulled out her bra and then she turned to the side of the stage where we always have several Nobel Prize winners who are on stage to hand out the prizes to the Ig Nobel winners. And she asked three of them to volunteer to help her demonstrate. <laughs> and they did. Um, you, you might want to watch the video of that moment. <laughs> oh, God. All right, any other questions? Dave? Yes. Uh with the real Nobel Prizes, forgive me for referring to your prize as the unreal prize. Uh, well, yeah, but, but our prizes are not in, they're not a fake or any other kind of Nobel Prize. There's no connection at all between <laughs> the prizes and the Nobel Prizes. You have to be, you have to be alive if, uh, to win the Nobel Prize. And you mentioned L. Ron Hubbard winning the prize. Uh, did you award that to him when he was still alive then? And did he say yes? We we tried. <laughs> it it was never. We were never able to get a clear answer from anybody um, to the question that you're asking about life or death. Uh huh. So so you awarded it to him uh, posthumously. Yeah. Well, we don't know. <laughs> that's who you asked. Oh, we don't know if he's still alive. Well, I I thought I I read something that he had passed away. A couple of decades ago, but am I incorrect in that? Well, you know, the most people seem to believe that, but there, there also are some people connected with that organization who were not giving out clear answers to that question. I see. So they actually, in part, won that award due to the ambiguity of their answers, which is what. Totally I'm not sure if it was because, but that was that was part of the way things unfolded. Oh, that that actually seems to be quite poetic justice, if you ask me. But anyway. Not being the big Dianetics fan that I am. <laughs> yes, sir. You keep mentioning offer them the prize. What is the prize? Ah, what, what is the what is the ah. physical and uh, uh, I guess the physical prize? 
It's different every year. It's always made from extremely cheap materials. If you look on the top <laughs> shelf there, there you can see a bunch of them. We give a we choose a theme every year for the ceremony, and so every year the the prize reflects that theme. Um, this was chemistry prize. I'll show you this one. Sorry, sorry. Uh. You know, it's different every year. When the pandemic hit and we weren't having everybody get together in the theater, we wanted to preserve the the best parts of the ceremony. And and the absolute heart of it is every time we announce a winner, you know, it's the first moment that it becomes public knowledge for each of them that this person or this team won. And the way we do it on stage is I announce the name and then there's a curtain right in the middle of the stage and the winner of the team comes through the curtain and there's a Nobel laureate holding the prize, hands it to him, shakes their hand and then they're kind of hustled over to the microphone and they give a one minute speech. Um, and we there's a lot of stuff if, if you look especially at some of the older ceremonies in the theater of we have we came up with effective ways of keeping speeches short i'll put it that way but during the pandemic we wanted to preserve that magic moment of nobel laureate hands something physical to the ig nobel winner and the real magic is you can see them looking in each other's eyes and they're both not quite believing this is happening and, <laughs> and in a room full of 1200 people you know everybody in the room is is reacting to everybody else and we wanted to try to preserve at least some of that but how do you do that when people are you know, thousands of miles away from each other um and we're having all the the bits and pieces happen or at least many of them over zoom and we came up with a way to do it that we've been doing during each of these pandemic years. That is, um, during these pandemic years, the prize is, um, we design a, a new prize every year, and then we put it in the form of a PDF document. And that's, um, we, we email that to the person who will be handing out the prize, and we email it to the winners, and they print it out and then fold it and assemble it. And I'll show you. Let's see, this was the first year that we did it, 2020. The theme of the ceremony that year was bugs. So what they put together was this box of paper, and every side has a picture of a bug, a computer bug, software bug, you know, cockroach, uh, Volkswagen <laughs> bug, uh, you know, famous flea. And then one piece of it is instructions. <laughs> and we're doing it online again this year. Um, so in the middle of September, if you tune in on September 14th at uh, improbable.com um, or YouTube, you'll be able to see it. The th I can tell you the theme this year of the ceremony, it's water. And the prize reflects that. And the opera also is about several things about water. Anyone else? Any other um, questions? I just wanted to make a, a comment in defense of looking at things upside down in astronomy. Uh -huh. What are the, because, oh, he can hear me because I'm so loud. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the famous moon illusion supposedly can be. Uh, uh, upset if you look at the moon if you bend over and look upside down through your legs at the moon mm -hmm. supposedly the moon will go back to its its normal appearance have you tried this yes of course i have has it been peer-reviewed <laughs> you might want to look up the paper that won them the prize um i don't remember whether that was a specific thing that they talked about there or not but it, it may have been but it, i did try it and the, the results were ambiguous, let me put it that way. Yeah, you can get stuck if you do that. Well, especially in my... Yeah. <laughs>
but I, I did in fact try it. And, uh, I've actually done it with children. Uh, uh, so you have, you'll see, a, a, if you ever see a large number of children with a wizard looking underneath through their legs at the moon, you'll know. I'll know exactly what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's even Thanks. more fun if you do it with a large group of adults. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Or in, no in public. Yeah. <laughs> do it on a street corner. Thank you. It always draws attention and people will ask you, what are you doing? That's right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Anybody, anyone else? No? All right. Well, Mark, that was great. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you thank all. You. Um, um, yeah. uh, let me mention that if, if anybody now or ever runs across somebody who or something who should be winning an Ig Nobel Prize, just drop us a note. Again, that's how we learn about most of these things. You know, one person notices something and tells us. And I hope you'll subscribe to the magazine if you like this yeah, kind of thing. For um, sure. Yeah, all this stuff is on the website, improbable.com. I look, I look forward to uh, this year's event. Thank you very much, okay. Mark. Okay, thank you all. This is fun. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night.